On October 9th, Kaesong is taken. This surrender frees South Korean city held by the Reds. Then on the east coast, Wonsan. Just two days after the fall of Kaesong, Rock 3rd Division troops seized the port of Wonsan, having marched 287 miles in 20 days to get there. They met little resistance. Next, the Red Capital itself. On October 17th, men of the 1st Cavalry Division worked their way into the outskirts of Pyongyang. In less than 24 hours, the North Korean capital is in United Nations hands. Psychological warfare plays an important role at this stage of the fighting. Using high-powered speakers, Skywar planes fly ahead of advancing UN troops, booming their message in Korean to the retreating enemy. Safe conduct passes prove highly effective. More enemy come lay down their weapons and wait for our troops to arrive. Two days after Pyongyang falls, our first combat airdrop in Korea gets underway in an attempt to cut off retreating Red forces north of Pyongyang. As at Incheon, the Supreme Commander personally supervises the operation. Nearly 2,000 troops making the jump. In a second wave, the heavy equipment arrives, Air Express. Local transportation is pressed into service. Next day, 1,800 reinforcements jump, but the enemy has already fled northward. In the east, rock forces continue their headlong charge north from Wonsan to take Hongnam. Meantime, a Navy task force is waiting off one side. 3,000 enemy mines had to be cleared from beach approaches before the Marine force could come ashore. It was a delay, but we could afford it. The rocks had made us a welcome present, a beach with no enemy guns on it. The whole division came ashore with nothing worse than a few wet feet. The mission now is to press this advantage, continue the attack toward the Alu. Swiftly, the Marine force moves in on red-held villages and towns. And just as swiftly, out the other side. Spirits are high. Three days later, and more than 100 miles closer to the Alu, the 7th Division makes its landing at Iwan. Ships of every description swarm into shallow water to disgorge 7,000 men and their machines. Their only opposition, the deep loose sand of Iwan's beaches. This far north, winter comes early to Korea. Cold weather uniforms are welcome as the division moves out to rejoin the attack. To the west, Marines are advancing over ground frozen harder every day. News of their approach runs ahead of them as village after village is liberated. North Koreans meet freely and the Christians among them pray openly for the first time since 1945. The shattered communist forces are pulling back into the last corner of this peninsula they had set out to conquer. UN troops follow as fast as the torturous terrain and increasing cold will allow. In the eastern sector, it is difficult even to keep contact with the retreating enemy. In the central sector, however, prisoners taken during a strong red counterattack give warning of potential danger. Many of them wear the quilted uniform of communist China. Meantime, in the northern sea of Japan, 
Winter is giving our offshore forces a taste of things to come. Even routine supply operations are becoming a nightmare of icy wind and pitching decks. We kept our aircraft warmed and ready to take off the minute the weather lifted. In the meantime, the Reds would have a lot less trouble moving troops and supplies on Korean roads. We didn't like that thought much. Ashore, the Chinese forces have pulled back, leaving a clear road to the Yalu. The village of Hai San Jin huddles against the banks of the Yalu across from Manchuria. Here, men of the 7th Division set up their outposts. It seems a sorry spot to spend Thanksgiving Eve. But from bases in the south, cargo planes are already taking off setting courses northward across the frozen mile. They carry crates rigged for airdrop and labeled perishable rush. Turkey and the trimmings, courtesy of the U.S. Air Force. All over Korea, mess kits overflow with steaming potatoes, giblet gravy, cranberry sauce, the works. Along the Yalu, everything is quiet. Every man, no matter what his duty for the day, shares in the traditional feast of gratitude. Headquarters feel certain that one more UN offensive will end the fighting in Korea. Actually, a whole new war is ready to begin. Across the Yalu, the decision has been made. Full-scale Chinese intervention is about the second phase of the Korean conflict to an end. Eighth Army's end of the war offensive was launched the day after Thanksgiving in 1950. It started out smoothly, but by nightfall of the second day, the UN was facing a new enemy in Korea, and a new war had begun. The Chinese rolled swiftly southward, splitting the Allied line and cutting off Marine and 7th Division troops in the east near the Chosin Reservoir. We, we took turns sleeping in the daytime. It was too cold at night. I heard later we lost more people from freezing and from enemy action. Mortar rounds froze through the casings. The Chinese had an awful lot of people between us and the beach, but the harbor at Hung Nam was our only way out. All our resupply came by air. Without that, we never could have made it. Same goes for the close air support we got from the Marine Air Wing and the Air Force. They fought their way toward the sea through an enemy force which outnumbered them five to one. Pausing only to evacuate wounded by air from Hagaru, they pushed on, reaching safety on December 10th. They found Hung Nam a busy town. Within the harbor's perimeter, heavy weapons worked around the clock, throwing up a curtain of fire through which the enemy divisions dared not pass. Behind the guns, a near miracle of planning, organization, and teamwork was taking place. A massive amphibious landing in reverse. In the space of 10 days, more than 100,000 fighting men were evacuated. North Koreans, by the tens of thousands, flocked to the dock area to plead for evacuation. From this one area, more than 90,000 North Koreans deserted their homes rather than return to the life they had experienced under communism. We were the last to leave. When we were gone, the harbor would be too. 
We set blocks of TNT and laced hoses filled with jellied explosive all along the waterfront. When we left, the harbor was one big ticking time bomb. Evacuation convoy steamed southward toward the free ports of Pusan and Pohang. Their troops would reland, regroup, and move back to engage the enemy. The military withdrawal by land was orderly as the rest of the 8th Army pulled back once again across the 38th parallel. But for hundreds of thousands of civilians trying desperately to outrun the advancing communists, the journey southward was a nightmare of cold, weariness, and confusion. Old people pulled loads meant for oxen or carried their precious few belongings on their backs. Children who had no part in the causes of war received full measure of its hardships just the same. On December 27th, General Ridgway arrived to replace General Walker, killed in a tragic jeep accident. He was just in time for the enemy's New Year's Eve offensive. Once again, UN troops pulled out of Seoul, blowing the Han River bridges behind them. Inchon, like Hung Nam, was evacuated by sea. Here, too, we took pains to leave nothing behind which the enemy could use. In the south, the troops which had been taken off the beach at Hong Nam were regrouped and despite bitter weather, took advantage of a welcome opportunity to catch up with themselves. By mid-January, the enemy offensive had bogged down. Using fire-hardened troops, Ridgeway launched a series of short, high-powered thrusts called Operation Killer. The enemy held a huge numerical advantage. Ridgeway was out to eliminate it. units moved up, expecting to meet great strength. They found surprising weakness. Under the pounding raids of Operation Killer, the enemy fell back. Ridgeway pressed the advantage. No rest for the enemy, and not much more for 8th Army. If anybody ever invents a mattress that feels half as good as a patch of frozen ground felt then, you'll make a million dollars. Although destruction of enemy forces remained its prime objective, Operation Killer had evolved into a ground-gaining operation. The way things were going, we couldn't stay outnumbered for long. The word was they were losing 10 men to our one. For six weeks, the seasoned fighters of 8th Army scoured the countryside, inflicting fantastic losses on the retreating Reds. On March 7th, the enemy's main stronghold east of Seoul was smashed. The next step would be Seoul itself. On March 15th, Korean troops entered the city. They found a few old people and children. The communists had fled. Across the full width of the peninsula, the enemy was retreating. Figure this one out. We're chasing them and they're leaving surrender posters behind for us. In April, General James Van Fleet arrived to take over the 8th Army. A canny tactician, 
He replaced General Ridgway, who had been appointed Supreme Commander when General MacArthur returned to the United States. Within a week of Big Jim's arrival, he was fighting off the Communist Spring Offensive. The Communists concentrated their barrages on the East Central Front, probing for a weak spot into which to pour their tides of humanity. UN forces were needed to slow the enemy's human wave tactics. We had a routine. Hold till the ammo ran out, then pull back and call for an airstrike. weather grounded the Air Force, units north of Seoul were forced back across the Imjin River. Seoul was fortified against the coming second wave of the Red Offensive. Van Fleet was determined not to lose the capital city again. Whoever said the worst part about war is the waiting was right. Still, we didn't have to wait long. Every road, every valley approach had been zeroed in beforehand. The enemy lost thousands of men, breaking through the curtain of fire, then faltered and lost his advantage. As the enemy turned once again to retreat northward, Van Fleet followed with mobile firepower. By June 2nd, we had recrossed the parallel. The enemy had spent 200,000 men, a third of his entire force, and gained nothing but the knowledge that numbers were not enough. Operation Killer continued without let-up. Within a month, truce feelers materialized into the first meetings at the red-held city of Quezon. World peace hopes soared. The chief UN negotiator was Vice Admiral Turner Joy. His opposite number, North Korea's chain-smoking General Nam Il. Pessimistic correspondents predicted the talks would drag on for as long as six weeks. With the opening of truce negotiations, the line became stabilized. With minor fluctuations, it would remain much the same until the ceasefire. New battle techniques were developed. In the eastern sector, a marine battalion made history by securing a hill in no man's land from the air by helicopter. The first wave landed a shore party which would clear the small landing area needed. In a matter of minutes, the first copter load of aerial cavalry was arriving. Fully equipped, fresh, ready for action. By using copters, the Marines secured commanding high ground within enemy territory without having to fight their way to it. Copters supplied the operation and evacuated troops at its completion, opening the way to a new concept in tactical troop movement. In Haesong, the truce talks were already bogging down, deadlocked over the issue of a ceasefire line. We didn't like the setup in Kaesong. It was the enemy's home ground, and he knew it. Namil used the talks as a propaganda loudspeaker. The so-called neutral area was crawling with armed red soldiers. We broke off the talks. 
Air Force Sabre jets ruled the skies. At this point in the fighting, the UN had lost less than 80 aircraft. Verified kills on communist planes numbered 510. sea as in the air, United Nations firepower went virtually unchallenged. Near the end of October 1951, truce talks were resumed at the tiny farming village of Panmunjom. The UN delegates offered a compromise. They would accept the communist proposed ceasefire along the present battle lines if all other problems could be ironed out within 30 days. If not, all bets were off. The war virtually stopped, except for the constant booming of artillery. Winter came, the deadline was passed, the war was on again. The deadlock issue now was the right of prisoners to free choice in the matter of repatriation. Both sides were adamant. Meantime, across the breadth of Korea were fought the bloody hill battles, names not difficult nor pleasant to remember. slopes were laid bare, pitted almost beyond believing. This war had reverted to the style of 1914, opposing trench lines facing one another, night patrolling and local attacks across the no man's land which lay between. It was costly, but there was no clear way out. The big break came in April 1953 with little switch, Stalin had died in March, and Malenkov had taken over. Immediately, he launched his worldwide peace offensive, and the Chinese agreed unconditionally to General Clark's standing proposal to exchange sick and wounded prisoners. The exchange went smoothly, and truce talks were resumed. Encouraged, the world listened for news of the final signing that would mean ceasefire in Korea. It came on July 27, 1953. While the communists signed at Panmunjom, General Clark, in ceremonies at the UN base camp in Munsan, signed six copies of the document which would end the bloodshed. There was excitement, but little rejoicing. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families and it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. The task now is to put the ceasefire agreement into full effect and get down to working out an enduring settlement of the Korean problem. I cannot find it in me to exult in this hour. 
rather it is a time for prayer that we may succeed in our difficult endeavor to turn this armistice to the advantage of mankind. In accordance with the truce agreement, the opposing forces now pulled back from one another. The open ground left between was to become the demilitarized zone, or DMZ. Operation Big Switch began on August 5th. Some 13,000 UN prisoners returned, most of them South Korean and American. In Big Switch, communism received a telling blow. Two-thirds of the captured Chinese refused repatriation, and 35,000 North Koreans decided to stay in South Korea. Among the returning Americans was General William Dean, captured in 1950 as he led his 25th Division in the defense of Taejon. Today, Korea is still divided, but the conflict was not wasted. It called the Kremlin's bluff in the Far East. It more than restored the violated border and left the Republic of Korea with the strongest free army in the Far East. It is true that the price of existence for this young republic from time to come will be constant vigilance. In that, Korea and the rest of the free nations are in the same boat.